Friday the 29th of May, 1942, was a typical late spring day in southern Australia. Cool, crisp and sunny. Generally good flying conditions. In the heart of Melbourne's industrialised inner suburbs sat the Fisherman's Bend Aerodrome. Nestled in a bend of the Yarra River, the airfield served the nearby Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation and Government Aircraft Factories plants, both of which were busy producing a number of military aircraft. Sitting on the runway that morning was a prototype of Australia's first domestically designed and produced fighter, the CA-12 Boomerang. As the boomerang soared over the Victorian sky that morning, the nation had achieved a milestone of real significance, especially given the dire strategic circumstance Canberra now faced. The aircraft Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation's test pilot, Ken Furwin, mounted that day had not even been a concept just six months before. The project itself had only been initiated the previous December. The fact that a nation which had never designed a modern military aircraft and had no domestic fighter production had produced that prototype in just six months was nothing short of a miracle. A marvel of improvisation and ingenuity, the boomerang was both a symbol of what the nation could achieve and the desperate situation it now found itself in. On December the 8th, 1941, Australians awoke to the news that Prime Minister John Curtin had declared war upon Japan. They were no strangers to the realities of a nation at war, but this conflict was different. No longer would Australia send her young men and women to defend the mother country and fight a war half a world away, this time the very shores of the Australian continent would become a battlefield. The existential threat posed by Imperial Japan was abundantly clear to all one that was made all the more acute after the catastrophic defeats at the Philippines and Singapore. The defence of the Australian continent and its approaches would require a massively expanded Royal Australian Air Force. But there was only one problem. Australia had no domestic fighter in production. The RAAF relied exclusively on the United States and United Kingdom to supply its fighter requirements, and within weeks orders for hundreds of P-40s and Spitfires were placed. However, both the British and American militaries had tremendous demand for new fighters themselves. The United States was in the midst of a mobilisation of truly historic proportions, and the Royal Air Force was embroiled in a highly attritional air battle across the Mediterranean. It was quickly made clear to Canberra that Australia's requirements were not considered to be of first order importance. Production would be allocated by the combined Chiefs of Staff to the RAAF only when other more important, demands had been met. This approach may well have made sense to the Alliance as a whole, as the simple reality was Australia was not a Western centre of gravity, but this was cold solace to a minor nation that was now facing the realistic possibility of invasion. The dark days of early 1942 should serve as a stark warning to those who argue that a sovereign Australian defence industry should be sacrificed in order to save money. In desperate times, even our closest friends will always look to serve their own interests first, as they should, and it is in these periods of real danger that the benefits of self-reliance truly manifest. Certainly, the parochial and myopic vilification of the Australian defence industry by those who cite the additional cost of domestic production is a true luxury of peacetime. We need look no further than the boomerang to see just how short-sighted this thinking is, especially given the strategic risk Canberra faces in the early 21st century. The government's anxiety over the question of if, or at least when, it would be receiving fighters from American and British production lines led to a drastic gamble. Australia would try and design, develop and manufacture a domestic fighter, one that was at least competitive with the A6M0. This was a colossal challenge for an Australian aircraft industry that was truly embryonic. Not only had CAC never developed a fighter before, it had never even produced one under license, but the nation had little choice. Luckily for all, there was some local aircraft production which could serve as the foundation for the new fighter. During the opening years of the war, RAAF operations in Australia had been focused upon generating pilots for Royal Air Force service in Europe and the Mediterranean. Thus, rather than a fighter, Australian aircraft industry had been building trainers. The CAC Wirraway, which was a licensed variant of the North American NA-16 trainer, had been in production since 1939. 
Additionally, the Bristol Beaufort torpedo bomber was being produced at the Commonwealth Department of Aircraft Production at Fisherman's Bend. Critically, Australian Beauforts were powered by the Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp radial engine, the same power plant utilised by the F4F Wildcat. Within these two entirely dissimilar aircraft, the Wirraway and Beaufort, a trainer and bomber, a fighter lurked, although it would take a good dose of Australian improvisation and ingenuity to bring this remarkable project to fruition. Australia had no choice. Britain simply did not have the productive capacity to spare, and the massive output of the United States was going first and foremost to the United States Navy and United States Army Air Corps. Luckily, the licensed production contract for the NA-16 contained a clause that the design could be modified by CAC, and thus the railway was selected as the basis for the new fighter. Of even greater fortune was the presence of some foreign expertise. Fred David, an Austrian Jew, had fled to Australia as a refugee. However, as he was an enemy alien, he had actually been interned. Fred had worked for Heinkel and Mitsubishi on projects including the A6M and HE-112, giving him an excellent understanding of contemporary fighter design. He was immediately recruited by CAC and became a critical member of the design team. With David on the team, the new platform quickly took shape. It would use the wings, tail, centre and undercarriage of the railway, meaning little additional tooling would be required. However, the new fighter would utilise the 1200 horsepower R1830 twin wasp engine, which was being produced at Lidcombe. The new power plant would be housed in a newly designed front section. The fighter would be armed with four 303 caliber machine guns and a pair of Hispano 20mm cannons, giving the platform excellent firepower. Allegedly, the Hispanos were reversed engineered from a souvenir brought back from North Africa. With the design rapidly maturing, on the 18th of February 1942, the War Cabinet placed an initial order for 105 aircraft, and the fighter was christened the CA-12 Boomerang. Considering it was a development of a rather dated armed trainer, the Boomerang provided surprisingly good kinematic performance. The design had been optimised around manoeuvrability, and flight tests clearly showed the Boomerang's superiority over the P-40 at low altitude. Much like the F-4F Wildcat which shared its engine, the primary problem with the CA-12 was its top speed and high altitude performance. The boomerang was crippled by the lack of a supercharger. A supercharged variant, the CA-14, was developed in 1943. When equipped with a new propeller and B-2 turbo supercharger, the new boomerang achieved a top speed that was 30% higher and an increase in operational ceiling of some 4,000 feet. The new variant was found to compare favourably, at least under some circumstances, to the Spitfire Mark V and P-47. Just as the new variant was about to enter production, Australia purchased a licence to domestically produce the P-51D Mustang, leading to the CA-14's cancellation. Throughout 1943 and 1944, the boomerang was hobbled in the fighter role by its lack of top speed and high altitude performance. It possessed the kinematic performance of 1941, which was already dated just two years later. The CA-12 had a long and illustrious career as a ground attack aircraft, however, where it served with distinction until the end of the war. Its heavy armament and low speed, low altitude maneuverability made it an excellent close air support platform. Some 250 boomerangs were produced during the war. By some miracle, Australian industry had developed the Wirraway into a highly effective fighter and had taken just six months to do it. With the success of the Boomerang, CAC began developing a far more capable replacement, the CA-15 Kangaroo. In mid-1943, under the leadership of Fred David, a dedicated design team at CAC began working on a clean sheet design. The new aircraft would be a full-blown escort fighter and interceptor. Although it resembled a P-51, the new fighter was heavily inspired by the Focke-Wulf FW-190 an aircraft that had deeply impressed the Western Allies when it was first encountered. Much like the German fighter, the Kangaroo was to be built around a radial engine, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 double wasp, a power plant made famous by fighters like the Thunderbolt, F6 Hellcat and Corsair. Only when it became clear that these engines were not available did CAC switch to an inline design, using the Rolls-Royce Griffin. The new engine required the placement of a supercharger under the kangaroo's belly, much like the Mustang, which is why the two aircraft look so similar. 
This resemblance was certainly not by design. The CA-15 was a beast of a prop fighter. With this power plant, it enjoyed similar high-altitude performance to the Mark 14 Spitfire and in some respects provided significantly improved manoeuvre performance. It was also fast. In a test flight over Melbourne, it achieved a dive speed of 502 miles per hour. But much like the Boomerang, the Kangaroo was just a year or two too late. Development of the platform was deliberately slowed by the introduction of the P-51D into RAAF service. It took to the skies in early March 1946. Had that been 1944, the Kangaroo may well have had a famous and successful period of wartime service. But by 1946, it was clear that jet aircraft were the way forward. The program was cancelled in 1950. In 1951, just 12 months after the cancellation of the Kangaroo, the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation purchased a production license for the North American F-86 Sabre. However, with what now constituted a highly capable design team in CAC, the decision was made to modify the Sabre. The F-86 was an excellent fighter, but it did have some significant weaknesses. The first was its thrust-to-weight ratio. For example, the MiG-15 was superior in a vertical dogfight. CAC decided to significantly alter the design to redress this problem. Instead of the American General Electric J-47 engine, CAC decided to utilise the Rolls-Royce Avon RA-7. The Avon provided nearly 2,000 pounds more thrust, but it was significantly larger than the J-47. This required a complete redesign of the aircraft, with alterations to the fuselage and a 25% larger air intake. CAC also redressed the other primary shortcoming of the Sabre, its lack of firepower. Rather than the typical six 50 caliber heavy machine guns, the Australian fighter used a pair of heavy hitting 30 mm Aiden cannons. Designated the CA-27, also known as the CAC Sabre or Avon Sabre, the new aircraft had a real claim to being the most potent air superiority fighter in the world, given the standard F-86's performance. But this proud heritage of Australian fighter design and manufacture would undergo a 50 year period of decline. Technically, the next two generation of Australian fighters, the Mirage 3 and FA-18 Hornet, would both be built in Australia, but this generally constituted the assembly of these aircraft from parts kits supplied from the manufacturers. The same was true of Australia's Bomber Force. The English Electric Canberra was manufactured by CAC, but this would not be the case for its replacement, the F-111. With the size of the RAAF shrinking, the economic rationale behind local design and modification simply no longer made sense. As the RAAF entered the 21st century, all of its frontline fighter aircraft, the F-35A and F-A-18F, were delivered directly from foreign production lines. That all changed on the 27th of February 2021. Nearly 78 years after Ken Furwin mounted his boomerang, an Australian designed and manufactured fighter was making its first flight but this time there was no pilot. In a moment of real historical significance for the Australian military, the loyal wingman, now known as the MQ-28A Ghost Bat, took to the skies over the Woomera Test Range in South Australia. Finally, after half a century, Australia is once again at the global forefront of combat aircraft design and development. But what exactly is this unmanned aircraft that made global headlines in 2021? Well, Perhaps it's best to begin by establishing what it isn't, rather than what it is. Firstly, this new aircraft is not a replacement for the manned fighter. Those of us who are old enough to recall the origins of the Joint Strike Fighter program will remember the widely held belief that unmanned combat air vehicles, or UCAVs, would replace the manned tactical fighter that we know and love. Indeed, the notion that the F-35 would be the last manned fighter ever designed and developed by the United States was often proclaimed as a simple fact, a certainty with which we would all have to become accustomed. The end of the fighter pilot was an uncomfortable reality for those of us who spent our childhoods watching Top Gun, but an inevitable fact which we would have to accept. Despite the conviction with which these statements were made at the time, we now know them to be false. Sixth generation platforms will be at least partially manned, and the fighter pilot has been given an indefinite stay of execution. The rationale which underpinned the assertion that the F-35 would be the last manned American fighter rested upon kinematic performance. When it came to the maneuver performance of an aircraft, 
the human being was now the weak link. Generally speaking, human biology can only sustain around 9 Gs before a pilot will suffer a blackout and loss of consciousness. A fit, young, healthy and highly trained pilot may be able to sustain up to 14 Gs for a short period, at least when wearing a G-suit. Nevertheless, by the year 2000, material science had advanced to a point that it was possible to make an airframe so strong that it could withstand significantly greater acceleration forces for a far longer period of time. Thus, the only thing holding the aircraft back was the person inside, and it was not a large leap of logic to assume that when it was time to design the sixth generation of fighter aircraft, these platforms would be unmanned systems capable of extreme maneuverability. The pilot would simply fly these aircraft via data link, and these next generation systems would literally fly rings around any unfortunate manned platforms unlucky enough to encounter them. But those who made these arguments with such certainty in the early 2000s were simply wrong, and the logic they advanced rested upon a basic misunderstanding of future trends in aerial battle. Whilst it is certainly true that an unmanned platform can outperform a manned fighter kinematically, the plain reality is manoeuvre performance simply isn't that important. Even in combat between fourth generation fighters, beyond visual range engagements were becoming dominant, and in a BVR fight, parameters like your radar and missile combination, acceleration, electronic warfare capability, countermeasures, data links and situational awareness more generally are all much more important than how many Gs you can sustain. In fact, when you are defensive and trying to dodge a missile, pulling too hard a turn will often make you more vulnerable because it will bleed energy. In combat between fifth generation fighters, Signature begins to dominate these other factors. Much like an engagement between two submarines, the side who detects the other first will typically have the opportunity to gain a positional advantage, which will manifest as a wider tactical advantage. Shooting without being seen is now the name of the game, and the value of sensors in electromagnetic and infrared signature reduction has made maneuver performance even less important. But what about within visual range engagements? Surely being able to sustain a 15G turn is still of substantial value. Well, even here, maneuver performance and kinematics more generally are not as important as one intuitively imagines. Even as far back as the Falklands War, within visual range engagements were dominated by missiles. The AM-9 Lima Sidewinder, which was used by the British, was an all-aspect missile, meaning it could track a target no matter which way it was facing. This meant that a Royal Navy Sea Harrier pilot could engage an enemy A-4 without getting on its tail. You still had to point the nose of the Harrier at the target, but with head-on engagements now possible, the traditional dogfight was becoming less important. The early 21st century witnessed the proliferation of high off-bore sight within visual range missiles, such as the R-73, AIM-9X, Iris-T and ASRAM. These weapons could track an enemy aircraft that was visible within its forward hemisphere, typically a cone between 90 to 180 degrees in width. When slaved to a helmet-mounted sight, a pilot could shoot a missile at an enemy fighter simply by looking at it. Things get even more advanced with 5th generation fighters. The F-35A is certainly no slouch when it comes to maneuverability. It provides comparable sustained turn rates to an F-16 with high alpha performance which is better than a Hornet, but it doesn't even need to turn to shoot a Sidewinder. The F-35A is equipped with EODAS, which is a 360 degree infrared search and track system. This system allows the F-35 to constantly monitor the airspace around it, automatically detecting, tracking and classifying hostile aircraft. When combined with a lock-on after launch capable missile, such as the AM-9X Block II, the F-35 can take a within visual range missile shot at any angle without turning the plane, even at targets directly behind it. None of this is to say that maneuverability is completely irrelevant in modern battle, but rather that traditional dogfighting performance simply isn't that important. Furthermore, it's only becoming less significant as we move through generations. That is a simple reality that many failed to grasp in the early 2000s. Another parameter which was often overlooked by unmanned advocates is just how good human beings are at making decisions and engaging with highly complex and dynamic environments. The modern fighter pilot is as much a battle manager as a dogfighter. 
he or she has to engage with a highly dynamic battle space that is populated with enemy fighters, hostile surface-to-air missile systems, civilians and friendly forces, elements that are constantly changing in position and priority. Computers may be able to beat the best humans in chess, but we are a very long way from AI being able to replace a human mind in a general tactical context. To fully replace a fighter pilot, you would probably require a general intelligence, something still very much within the realms of science fiction. Using over-the-horizon data links for command and control may be all well and good when one is operating an MQ-9 Reaper in a permissive environment, such as the tribal areas of Pakistan, but... As these communications are subject to advanced electronic warfare capabilities, in a near-term high-intensity conflict, they will certainly be less reliable. If you have a pilot removed from the platform by an ocean, then the loss of your communication satellite means the loss of your whole capability. Line-of-sight data links are much harder to disrupt. Thus, it simply made more sense to keep the human mind right there, in the system, which is why 6th generation fighters will be manned. What we are seeing with the emergence of unmanned systems across multiple domains of warfare is the primacy of the manned unmanned team. Rather than replacing manned platforms, unmanned systems are being used to both supplement and enhance them. When compared against one another, manned and unmanned platforms both have advantages and disadvantages, and thus by leveraging a force structure which combines both, you get the best of both worlds. You can keep the intelligence, flexibility, and moral calculation of a human being whilst enjoying the persistence, performance, and expendability of unmanned systems. This set of concepts is absolutely foundational in any understanding of the MQ-28A, what its capabilities are, what its design goals were, and what it is, and isn't, capable of. The Ghost Bat isn't a superfighter which is designed to outperform the F-35A, it probably can't even outturn its manned sibling. In fact, when one examines its probable basic performance statistics, it really isn't all that impressive. Before we get into a wider discussion of the platform, it must be stressed that the MQ-28A is a developmental system. It is the Australian equivalent of an X-plane, and thus there are many things which we do not know about it, either because these capabilities are classified, or, more plausibly, because of how immature the system is. Thus, the following analysis contains an unavoidably large amount of speculation, as any analysis of the ghost bat must rest on the stipulation that we are only engaging with what is plausible, given the platform's general characteristics and design goals. The Air Power Teaming System, or MQ-28A Ghost Bat, is a medium-sized, unmanned combat air vehicle being designed to meet the Royal Australian Air Force's specific requirements under the Loyal Wingman Program. Although, generally speaking, the MQ-28 is commonly described as a Boeing aircraft, leading some to imply that it is actually just an American platform being made for the RAAF. This is not true. Although Boeing Australia, which is the Australian unit of Boeing, is the leading partner in the Loyal Wingman program, a consortium of over 30 companies are contributing to the Ghost Bat. For example, the critical AI component is being developed by BAE Systems Australia. Although many large, multinational defence companies have business units in Australia, and thus can leverage their wider institutional knowledge to aid these programs, the research and development is happening in Australia and being paid for by the Australian government, who owns all of the associated intellectual property. This is unequivocally an Australian military project. The Loyal Wingman concept, the requirements of which the MQ-28A was developed to meet, envisaged the creation of a manned-unmanned air power team, one that could greatly enhance the RAAF's order of battle. The Royal Australian Air Force and ADF more generally face a unique set of challenges. Although certainly comparable to the European powers, Australia's population is small in comparison to the major nations of Asia. Nonetheless, Australia is, and always has been, a disproportionately wealthy country with a very high standard of living and per capita GDP. In fact, it is a very significant economic power in global terms. Any nation with those characteristics will look to quality to offset the force ratio disadvantage it faces, preferring fully professional, highly trained forces fielding leading edge military technology. This is also a useful force structure for a middle power that is embedded within a global alliance structure, one that will often deploy elements in support of global military operations. 
providing small contingents of very high quality forces will tend to be of disproportionate military value to our allies. The current structure of the RAAF reflects this reality. Its order of battle is small, just four fighter squadrons deploying roughly 100 aircraft. But these squadrons field some of the most capable aircraft and weapons in contemporary warfare. Just as an example, every fighter the RAAF deploys has a third generation AESA fire control radar. Every one fields a high off boresight missile capability, and the RAAF possesses potent standoff weapons such as the JASSM. Number 81 Wing, composed of numbers 3, 77 and 75 squadrons, are all equipped with the F-35A, whilst number 1 squadron deploys the F-A-18F Block 2. But the RAAF's capability is far more potent than its fighter numbers would imply. Behind these fighter squadrons is a myriad of supporting assets and capabilities which act as force multipliers. Electronic attack aircraft such as the EA-18G, the E-7 Wedgetail AESA-equipped airborne warning and control aircraft, tanker aircraft like the KC-30, the MC-55A Peregrine electronic surveillance aircraft, the P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft, and drones like the MQ-4C Triton. In addition to the aircraft are ground-based assets such as Jorn and Vigilair. All of these supporting assets enhance the capabilities of the fighter force, allowing it to generate far higher levels of combat power than its small size would initially suggest. For example, through its combination of low observable strike fighters, airborne sensors, electronic warfare and electronic intelligence assets, the RAAF is equipped to fight for the dominance of the electromagnetic spectrum in a way that no other regional competitor can. In fact, it's a capability fielded by few globally. But this force structure has its downsides, the first amongst which is how top-heavy it is. This large ensemble of supporting assets has to be defended by a force of just four fighter squadrons. Exacerbating this vulnerability is the regional proliferation of Eastern Bloc fifth-generation fighters, such as the Chinese J-20 and J-31, and potentially the Russian Su-57. Because these platforms are more difficult to detect at long range, they pose a greater threat to supporting assets such as tankers and AWACS aircraft. In addition to these new platforms, the PLA specifically is developing much longer-ranged air-to-air missiles, including the PL-15, which has a reported maximum range that is well beyond 100 nautical miles. Unlike fourth-generation threat aircraft, when armed with the PL-15, a J-20 being able to penetrate the RAAF's outer fighter defences and engage the tankers or E-7s is a very plausible scenario. This increased threat means the RAAF will have to delegate extremely valuable fighters to act as close escorts. Not only will this dilute the ADF's meagre fighter assets, but if you need to babysit a wedge tail, an F-35A is massive overkill. Its combination of stealth, sensors, weapons, networking and electronic warfare capabilities mean the F-35 will always be much better employed taking on more important missions, such as fighting for air superiority or penetrating an enemy's integrated air defense system to strike critical targets. Therefore, the opportunity cost of using the F-35A as a tanker escort, with its exquisitely trained and capable pilot on board, is extremely significant for an air force with such a comparatively small order of battle. The second major issue with the RAAF's current force structure and fundamental strategy is its lack of mass. Ever since the 1970s, the RAAF's combat air group has had essentially the same structure and strength. Four, or five, squadrons totaling around 100 combat aircraft. For example, in the fourth generation, numbers 3, 77 and 75 squadrons fielded the FA-18 Hornet, 75 of which were split between number 81 wing's combat squadrons and the operational conversion unit. Number 82 wing, specifically number 1 and 6 squadrons, operated the F-111C and F-111G Aardvark strike aircraft, around 30 of which were operational depending upon the time period. This fundamental order of battle, which has been in place since the early 1970s, is basically the same in 2022. Three squadrons of F-35As, one squadron of Super Hornets, and one squadron of EA-18G Growlers. The aircraft may have improved, but so has the wider threat environment. This order of battle and force structure were developed during the Cold War. Throughout this period, the primary symmetric threat the RAAF was designed to counter was Indonesia, 
certainly something a force of this size could achieve given its technological sophistication. Any general conflict with the Soviet Union would be fought in Europe and North Asia, a very long way away from Australia, meaning the ADF would follow its traditional strategy and provide reasonably small, but high quality, contingents to support Allied operations in theatres a very long way from home. But now, in the early 21st century, Australia's strategic environment is far less benign. For the first time since the fall of Imperial Japan, a great power has risen in East Asia, one which is investing heavily in naval and aerospace capabilities. Worse, under the leadership of Xi Jinping, the People's Republic has made its revisionist intentions crystal clear. It aims to replace the current global order, in which Australia is deeply embedded, with one dominated by China. Thus, Australia's closest ally and primary security partner, the United States, is now in a posture of full-blown strategic competition with Beijing. This time, any conflict between the superpowers will occur right on Australia's doorstep, and in that scenario, the ADF will be facing the immense air power of the PLAAF and PLAN operating in and around the Australian theatre itself. The sheer mass of the PLA and the number of platforms it could plausibly concentrate against Australia, even in a scenario where its forces would be diluted fighting the wider Western alliance, raise serious questions as to the viability of the current force structure in the event of a general regional conflict, despite its technological advantage. For example, just how much attrition could the RAAF sustain before its core capability was compromised? It may well be able to overwhelm a regional competitor like Indonesia with a rapid and devastating air campaign, but can it sustain months of high-intensity operations with all of its forces? Given how expensive a modern fighter like an F-35A is, and how long and expensive it is to train pilots, even if it inflicted disproportionate losses on the PLA, the RAAF's small size will seriously limit its staying power. It is these fundamental weaknesses that the air power teaming system is designed to address. By leveraging its wealth, alliances, advanced manufacturing capacity and extensive research and development base, Australia can offset the ADF's small size through unmanned systems. If the RAAF could field a locally designed and built UCAV, one that was capable of basic air combat and limited strike, then this lack of mass could be easily addressed. With this new drone taking up the more mundane tasks where one would typically use a fighter, such as escorting a tanker, the RAAF's far more capable manned platforms could be used to much greater effect, dramatically increasing not only the size, but the efficiency of the force as a whole. Another critical area where such a drone could be of significant utility is in combat between 5th generation fighters. Unlike a battle between 4th generation platforms, where one can reasonably assume a good likelihood that both sides will have detected one another before a BVR missile engagement, combat between stealth fighters is much more akin to a duel between submarines. Detecting and gaining a firing solution on your enemy without being detected yourself is foundational to 5th generation combat and thus limiting your electromagnetic signature by restricting radar emissions will be critical. Even low probability of intercept AESA radars will increase the possibility of detection somewhat. Much like the application of unmanned undersea vehicles, when used with a fifth generation fighter, a stealthy drone will greatly enhance its passive sensor footprint and weapon engagement envelope. Flying ahead of a flight of F-35As, these drones could scan for the infrared signature of approaching J-20s, massively enhancing their situational awareness. They could even act as off-board missile launch platforms, increasing the total volume of fire a force could generate and allowing an F-35 to engage a target without ever coming into enemy missile range. Within the manned-unmanned team, the drone is an extension of the F-35, allowing for its sensors and weapons to be arranged in a battle network which is dispersed over hundreds of square kilometers, massively enhancing the manned platform's capability, survivability, and reach. There is only one small problem with this concept. Currently, there is no unmanned combat air vehicle that can meet the RAAF's requirements. In fact, a whole new kind of drone has to be invented. Unmanned aircraft have been a mainstay of warfare for decades now, an entire air campaign was waged against Al-Qaeda in the tribal areas of Pakistan by drone, and the exploits of the Bayraktar in Ukraine are well known. 
but these kinds of unmanned aircraft are better described as remotely piloted, or at least remotely operated, unmanned air systems. An MQ-9 Reaper literally has a flight crew, a pilot and co-pilot, who remotely operate the vehicle. Many drone strikes that were staged from Afghanistan were flown in the continental United States, with air crew literally flying the aircraft from bases in Nevada. Even when navigating via autopilot, a human being oversees the entire mission, operating the drone's weapons and often manually lands the aircraft. This kind of arrangement is simply not a practical solution for the loyal wingman concept. In simply operating their own platform, an F-35A pilot already has a multitude of tasks to complete, not to mention a complex tactical picture to engage with. Micromanaging a drone, or a flight of drones, is simply not a practical proposition. Additionally, the ability to acquire these systems at scale would be severely limited if every MQ-28 sortie required a flight crew to manage the drone, compromising one of the air power teaming system's primary benefits. If this idea is going to work, then the drone needs to be autonomous, not just taking off, flying and navigating without supervision, but it needs to be smart enough to complete complex missions with just a simple command. If an incoming missile volley is detected and the F-35A has to become defensive, its escorting loyal wingmen need to be able to react to the situation all by themselves. With a single command, the Ghost Bats should engage the threat, executing pre-planned tactical maneuvers and employing countermeasures without any input from a human being. If a pilot is doing everything they can to defeat an incoming missile, they will hardly have the spare time or mental bandwidth to manage the escorting UCAVs. To put it simply, no unmanned air vehicle has this level of autonomy, and the AI has to be developed before the MQ-28A can even fulfill the role envisaged for it. This is undeniably the greatest technological challenge facing the program, and will be its key capability breakthrough. Once this level of AI is developed, it will open up a myriad of possibilities, both tactically and from a platform design perspective. BAE Systems Australia has been selected to supply the unmanned flight vehicle management solution and simulation capability for the loyal wingman, in addition to the flight control computers and navigation equipment. Once you have developed this smart, autonomous drone that is capable of acting as a loyal wingman to your manned fighters and other aircraft, a whole suite of other roles become possible. After all, if an MQ-28A can fly itself to an E-7, escort it for several hours and then return to base, it can also fly itself to any coordinates and conduct a raft of different missions. In order to leverage the inherent flexibility of an autonomous drone, the MQ-28A is equipped with a detachable nose section. Essentially, the front of the aircraft is a hard point and the nose section is its payload. This payload section contains about 1.5 cubic meters in volume, which is large enough to accommodate a modern AESA fire control radar such as the AN-APG-79, although perhaps a lighter system like the ELM-2052 may be required. It could also house infrared search and track systems, electronic surveillance packages, or dedicated ground mapping synthetic aperture radars. By leveraging the precision of AESA arrays, the Ghost Bat could deploy a highly potent, dedicated electronic attack capability, allowing it to act as a standoff jammer in the same way to the F-35, attacking specific hostile radars. These nose sections are designed to be rapidly removed and changed. This makes the Ghost Bat mission configurable. A single aircraft could be configured as an electronic intelligence platform, stealthily detecting and geolocating hostile radars and communications. Then, in a matter of minutes, the same airframe can be deployed in an air defense configuration with an AESA fire control radar and a pair of AIM-120s. The combination of payload modularity, stealth, range, autonomy and cost makes the Ghost Bat an exceptionally versatile platform, allowing it to take on the most dangerous tasks where the chance of losing an aircraft will be high. It is this mix of competing priorities that have determined the MQ-28A's basic characteristics and capabilities. It needs to be capable enough to successfully complete the mission demanded of it, but it also needs to be simple and inexpensive enough that it can be manufactured in Australia with a local supply chain and procured in large numbers. Although estimating platform costs this early in the program is problematic, we can probably expect a per unit flyaway price to be less than 10 million Australian dollars. 
estimates of as low as 2 to 4 have been made, although this probably does not include the nose section. In order for the MQ-28 to be attritable, it needs to be inexpensive enough that losing a number of them will not break the bank. Thus, keeping costs down is foundational to the entire concept. You can see this in basically every element of the aircraft. In terms of kinematic performance, the Ghost Bat is certainly nothing special. Although general performance parameters have not been published, several things can be surmised given its basic design. The first is the MQ-28A, at least as it currently exists, is not supersonic. This can be deduced from its aerodynamic layout, specifically its 30 degree wing sweep, and the thrust of its engine. Currently the Ghost Bat is powered by a commercial jet engine in the VLJ class, which are predominantly used in small private jets, such as the Citation Mustang. This is most probably the Pratt & Whitney Canada PW600, which generates around 1,600 pounds of thrust, although a military version could offer increased performance. This would give the MQ-28 a cruising speed in the high subsonic range, allowing it to keep up with the aircraft it is intended to work with, but nothing more. When equipped with a more powerful engine, the aerodynamics would allow the Ghost Bat to go supersonic, or in a dive with its current power plant. Boeing has further provided for supersonic flight by shaping the fuselage sides to form divertless supersonic inlets. No information on the Ghost Bat's sustained or instantaneous turn rate has been released thus far, although Boeing has claimed it possesses fighter-like performance. In terms of signature, the story is the same. The MQ-28 is a stealthy aircraft, but its RCS is almost certainly at least one order of magnitude higher than the F-35. At least in its current iteration, the Ghost Bat relies purely on shaping to reduce its signature. Its skin is composed of standard carbon fiber reinforced plastic over an aluminium substructure, rather than a carbon nanotube infused carbon fiber matrix, the radar absorbing material that is baked into the skin of the F-35. Including this level of signature reduction would greatly increase cost and the difficulty of manufacture. We cannot rule out the limited use of radar absorbent materials on the operational version of the aircraft, but we can expect this to be limited by cost. The MQ-28 does include many features designed to limit its radar cross-section, such as the use of planform alignment and stealthy air intakes. It is probably significantly stealthier than a clean Super Hornet, for example. Obviously, RCS is something which is very difficult to judge by simply looking at an aircraft, but we can be sure that the MQ-28 is stealthy enough that it can operate alongside an F-35 without revealing its presence to long-range radar systems. In terms of basic characteristics, the Ghost Bat is some 11.6 meters long and has a wingspan of 7.3 meters. It has a dry weight of some 3 tons. The MQ-28 can be rapidly disassembled. Its wings and nose section can be removed allowing for the whole aircraft to fit inside a standard 40 foot shipping container. This allows the drone to be rapidly moved by air, land and sea by simply using commercial logistics services. This includes a standard prime mover and semi-trailer. A significant internal fuel fraction can be deduced from its published range, which is some 2,000 nautical miles or 3,700 kilometers. This is a ferry range, meaning flying from one airfield to another. Its combat radius, meaning the range at which it could complete a mission, would probably be around 900 nautical miles, significantly more than the F-35A or F-A-18F. As can be expected of a prototype, the MQ-28 is currently not armed. However, initial concept images indicate plans for a reasonably large internal weapons bay between the landing gear. There is certainly enough space for such a weapons bay. This appears to be about 3.5 metres in length, long enough to accommodate the AIM-120 AMRAAM. Although we are speculating here, a weapons payload of about 300 kilograms or 660 pounds seems plausible given the small engine and tight weight constraints. This size of the weapons bay and maximum payload would allow the MQ-28A to field a pair of AIM-120Ds or, alternatively, two GBU-53B Stormbreaker small diameter bombs. A single 1,000 pound payload bomb bay, the same as one of the F-35B's internal weapons bays, is not unthinkable, but it might be too much to hope for given how small the Ghost Bat is. In any case, because of the lethality, versatility and precision of these weapons, just the AMRAM and Stormbreaker 
would allow the MQ-28 to perform a myriad of different combat missions across multiple domains. Once fully developed and operational, the MQ-28A will act as an affordable and expendable complement to the RAAF's expensive fleet of fifth-generation fighters and supporting assets like tankers, jammers, and ISR platforms. When going into battle, an F-35A flight will be preceded by eight MQ-28s, using their onboard infrared search and track systems to passively detect enemy fifth-generation fighters, massively increasing the F-35's sensor footprint. When organized in a battle network, the MQ-28 and F-35 will operate as an integrated team, with the unmanned system acting as an extension of the manned fighter, even taking off-board missile shots at incoming targets. When engaging an RAAF squadron, an enemy element will have to contend with dozens of ghost bats in addition to the F-35s, each stealthily hunting for their prey, greatly complicating the tactical picture facing any hostile force. When an F-35 element is conducting a strike mission, its escorting MQ-28s can act as jammers, targeting hostile radars and potentially drawing enemy surface-to-air missile fire. Further to the rear, the MQ-28s will keep watch over the RAAF's precious tankers and wedgetails. Acting as a close escort, if a hostile element broke through and engaged these supporting high-value assets, they would immediately be engaged by the ghost bats, forcing the enemy to become defensive and allowing the vulnerable tankers to escape. They could even deliberately bait incoming missiles, acting as impromptu decoys. Freed from the requirement to defend the tankers, the RAAF's extremely capable manned platforms will be free to undertake the kind of offensive missions for which they were designed, such as penetrating integrated air defense systems and striking high-value targets. Over and above these basic functions, the MQ-28 can also be used as a standalone, rudimentary air defense and strike platform. For example, the ADF's bare bases and southern population centers could be protected by squadrons of MQ-28As, allowing the F-35s and Super Hornets to mass their capability in the north. These ghost bat elements could be operated by a relatively small crew and ground-based command and control. Heavily defended targets, including high-end area defense systems, such as HQ-9 or S-400 surface-to-air missile batteries, could be attacked by tens of MQ-28As, which only have to come within Stormbreaker standoff range to launch their weapons, about 100 kilometers depending upon the altitude. Even if half of the force is destroyed, Given how comparatively rare these wide area air defense systems are, the return on investment would clearly be worth it. The Ghost Bat could also be used extensively by deployed forces in a low intensity conflict. If we imagine another deployment to the Middle East, rather than sending elements of Super Hornets to deploy the Australian Battle Group, with all of the associated personnel and cost, simultaneously diluting the RAAF's capability at home, 12 MQ-28As could be cheaply and easily deployed by a commercial shipping container. Although the Ghost Bat is certainly no A-10 when it comes to firepower, the force would now have a dedicated fast jet element in support that can safely conduct a variety of supporting missions, from reconnaissance to air defense and, yes, even limited close air support. A small diameter bomb may have a very small area of effect, but its precision means it can be used to effectively support ground forces. An enemy strong point or bunker could easily be struck by a stormbreaker, and the speed of the MQ-28 allows for a responsiveness that simply cannot be provided by helicopters. The dedicated ISR capability alone would be extremely valuable to a deployed battle group. Despite its limitations, when procured in hundreds, this humble little drone will undoubtedly revolutionize the ADF's air warfare capability. This brings us to the thorny topic of naval aviation and the potential applications of unmanned systems within the Royal Australian Navy. However, in order to fully discuss the possibility of the MQ-28 in the maritime domain, a wider discussion of Australian naval aviation is unfortunately unavoidable, much of which focuses upon the F-35B. Although this may not seem immediately relevant to the current discourse, the same arguments for and against the F-35B could well be made for any navalized MQ-28A, and thus must be addressed here. For reasons that I do not fully understand, the Australian strategic community writ large, from the think tanks to the forums, seems to be incapable of having a balanced, 
mature conversation about naval air power in the ADF. When it comes to this capability specifically, the quality of the discussion is strangely poor. Many arguments advanced by the anti-naval aviation camp are simply bad, and, in truth, some are borderline disingenuous. This is despite the long history of aircraft carriers in the Royal Australian Navy and the global proliferation of pocket, stovel carriers which have been revolutionised by the F-35B. When smart people make poor arguments, this tends to be indicative of bias, especially when there is more convincing reasoning against the F-35B and ADF service, although these arguments tend to be based on force structure priorities and cost and thus lack the kind of slam-dunk rebuttal those in the anti-naval Asian camp are clearly looking for. The kind of groupthink that dominates the forums on this topic is probably to be expected, given the vulnerability of those communities to said phenomenon, but these poor arguments have also been made by professional academics, including ASPI. It seems apparent that many influential members of the wider Australian strategic community have an axe to grind when it comes to naval aviation, which has led to a serious distortion of the wider debate. We somehow seem to be unable to dispassionately weigh the benefits and costs of naval aviation, which is, after all, a military capability like any other. As I have argued previously, the lack of fixed-wing naval aviation, specifically fighters, is one of the most glaring and significant capability gaps currently facing the ADF. Providing a task force with organic fighter cover provides many tactical and operational benefits. A 12-strong squadron of F-35Bs represents a truly substantial concentration of combat power. Even in its stovel form, the Lightning II is a formidable strike fighter. Its combination of supersonic dash and the AIM-120D and AN-APG-81 missile radar combination make it highly capable in the fleet defense role. A flight of F-35Bs can simultaneously engage 32 incoming maritime strike platforms with beyond visual range missiles some 400 nautical miles from the carrier. Furthermore, given its sensors and low signature, the F-35B is more than capable of engaging land-based fighters, allowing the task force to fight for air superiority, which may be critical in any high-end amphibious operation. Along that vein, the Lightning is an excellent tactical strike platform, providing the amphibious force with close air support and interdiction, even if the enemy has deployed high-end air defense systems that may limit the employment of helicopters. Outside of the amphibious mission, when armed with potent standoff weapons such as the JASSMER and JSO, the F-35B is more than capable of strategic strike, allowing for a pocket stovel carrier to represent a real power projection capability. Finally, when armed with a 3 to 400 nautical mile ranged anti-ship cruise missile, such as the JSM or LRASM, the F-35B equipped task force can now strike surface vessels at a range of almost a thousand nautical miles, greatly increasing the area of sea control the formation can generate. Yes, the Tomahawk Block 5A may have a similar range, but the volume of fire that can be generated by that weapon is limited by the Mark 41 VLS space allocated to it, and as it stands today, the RAN is already short of VLS cells. To claim that the Royal Australian Navy would be a far more potent and capable force with a stovel carrier capability built around the F-35B is hardly a controversial statement, at least in a perfect world where cost was not a major constraining factor. But does any of the above really represent a capability gap? Those capabilities may be all well and good, but does the ADF really need any of them to complete the kind of missions that the government is likely to demand of it? After all, classic power projection is simply not a core mission for the Australian military. Thus, aren't Stovel advocates simply falling into the classic trap of desiring a capability for its prestige rather than its real-world utility? as carrier opponents contend. Well, there are a few areas where I would argue that the lack of organic fighter cover does represent a real and critical capability gap for an RAN task force, especially when one envisages deploying it in a high-end threat scenario. Chief amongst these vulnerabilities is anti-ship cruise missile defense. 
One of the major developments in Eastern Bloc anti-ship cruise missiles over the last 30 years is the proliferation of supersonic sea skimmers. Russian and Chinese anti-ship cruise missiles, such as the 3M34E Club and YJ-18, which are very similar systems, combine a terminal attack speed of Mark III with a very low altitude of 2 to 5 meters. The combination of low altitude prosecution and very high terminal velocity puts enormous pressure on line of sight missile defenses, such as those that are currently fielded by the RAN, primarily the SM2 and ESSM. As these missiles come screaming over the radar horizon at 2000 knots, a Hobart class destroyer will only have 30 seconds to shoot them down. With such immense pressure being placed on the RAN's defensive OODA loop, it will not take all that many of these systems to saturate the task force's missile and gun defenses. Given the proliferation of these weapons, both in the Russian and Chinese militaries and regionally, the supersonic anti-ship cruise missile represents an extremely significant vulnerability. The primary means by which the USN is countering the supersonic sea-skimming missile is by over-the-horizon surface-to-air missile shots. Enabled by weapons like the SM-6, SM-2 Block 3C and ESSM Block 2, a USN carrier strike group will be able to engage these incoming missiles at a range of some 130 nautical miles. This capability is called Naval Integrated Fire Control Counter-Air, which is a component of cooperative engagement capability. The way it works is the task force as a whole is connected by digital data links to form a battle network, allowing for one sensor to generate a firing solution for a missile on board a different platform, which can then complete an over-the-horizon missile shot. This extended defensive missile engagement envelope effectively offsets the speed of the incoming anti-ship cruise missile by buying the defense's time and allowing for multiple intercept opportunities. Although the Hobart-class destroyers are currently equipped with Keck, really you need an airborne sensor to make this capability shine. Even if you use a radar picket to extend the task force's air search radar coverage, as HMS Sheffield discovered in 1982, that radar picket will still be just as vulnerable. The F-35 is ideal in this role. One of the things that make the Lightning so special is its sensor suite. It is a more capable ISR platform than dedicated systems of the last generation. Tearing through the lower atmosphere at Mark III means supersonic sea skimmers inherently have massive infrared signatures. The F-35's distributed aperture system provides the aircraft with 360 degrees of persistent imaging infrared coverage. To EODAS, an incoming YJ-18 or P-800 Onyx will look like a beacon shining in the darkness. Once detected, the weapon can be tracked by the Lightning's AESA radar. The AN-APG-81 is an immensely capable radar system. Unlike the reasonably limited mechanically scanned arrays of fourth generation fighters, modern, third generation AESA radars are so sensitive and have such a large range potential that they can allow the F-35 to act as an airborne early warning platform. Achieving a track at 80 to 100 nautical miles on a large missile is not out of the question for the APG-81. Thus, by simply having a single F-35 airborne above the formation, the task force's radar horizon for very low altitude targets has been increased by a factor of 10. This capability was demonstrated in 2016 when a USMC F-35B acted as the airborne sensor for an over-the-horizon SM-6 missile shot. The second major area of ASCM vulnerability is the inability of an RAN task force to deal with a lurking, high-altitude, long-endurance UAV or maritime patrol aircraft. The successful employment of long-range maritime strike systems, such as anti-ship cruise missiles and even anti-ship ballistic missiles, requires the implementation of a reasonably complex kill chain. In order to shoot a missile, you have to detect the target, track it over time as it moves, classify it, ensuring it is what you think it is, maneuver your launch platforms into position, and then support your missile shot. This is actually a more complex process than people intuitively think. Satellites, for example, are very useful at detecting targets, but are bad at sustaining a track. That's because the kind of Earth observation satellites that track ships fly in low Earth orbit. For example, the Soviet USA Rorsat used a very low altitude of around 250 kilometers. At this altitude, the orbital velocity is about 8 kilometers per second, 
meaning the satellite will only provide intelligence over a given area for a very small period of time. Plus, at this low altitude, the sensor's field of view, called a swath, is reasonably small. This is a critical limitation for ships because they move, often at up to 30 knots in an unknown direction. This creates an ever-increasing area where the ship could be, called the Area of Uncertainty, or AOU, which grows exponentially. In just two hours, if a task force was steaming at 30 knots, the Area of Uncertainty would be some 11,309 square nautical miles, much larger than the sensor footprint of a missile seeker. This means you have to supplement space-based sensors with other platforms that can provide sustained contact with the task force as it moves. These are typically maritime patrol aircraft or high-altitude, long-endurance UAVs, like a Triton. The major vulnerability the RAN faces here is that without any organic fighter cover, there is nothing to prevent a hostile drone or MPA loitering just beyond the task force's defensive missile envelope. From this position of safety, the platform can even use a long-range radar to generate a high-fidelity missile firing solution, which can then be data-linked to surface ships, submarines, and maritime strike aircraft. The YJ-18 has a range of over 200 nautical miles, depending upon the launch platform. Provided with this information, a Yuan-class submarine could launch a standoff YJ-18 strike from well beyond the ASW perimeter of the task force, one that would be very hard to prevent. But, without this persistent firing solution, the submarine would have to rely upon its own sensors, which have a much shorter range, meaning it would have to approach the task force and deal with the hunters. One of the original driving concepts behind the development of the Sea Harrier was to provide Royal Navy ASW hunter-killer groups with the ability to counter loitering maritime patrol aircraft, such as the Bear Foxtrot and this is as much a problem today as it was in the 1980s. The third major limitation of solely relying upon surface-to-air missile defences is the inability to prevent maritime strike aircraft from standing off. The PLA has an increasingly potent maritime strike capability in the form of the H-6 bomber. A modernised variant of the Tu-16 Badger, the H-6 has been transformed into a highly potent missile carrier. Although still a subsonic and unstealthy bomber, the combination of long-range, heavy payload and the integration of standoff missiles have made the H-6 a very capable maritime strike platform. For example, the modernised H-6K can carry four supersonic YJ-12 anti-ship cruise missiles over a combat radius of some 1,000 nautical miles. The YJ-12 has a high-altitude launch range of some 220 nautical miles, well beyond the reach of even SM-6. Without any kind of fighter cover, a squadron of H-6s could simply stand off and hurl supersonic anti-ship cruise missile volleys at our RAN task force. Even if the missile defences successfully shot them all down, the PLA could simply repeat this process with another raid 6-12 to 12 hours later, meaning that at some point, the Hobart-class destroyers and Hunter-class frigates will simply run out of missiles and the task force will have to head back to base and rearm achieving a mission kill on the formation. The long range of the H-6 and its ability to be tanked, meaning this threat extends well out into the Western Pacific and Eastern Indian Oceans. But it's not only the Chinese who pose this kind of a threat. The Russian P-800 Onyx missile, which is currently fielded by the Indonesian military, has an air-launched variant, the Yakont M, which is small enough to be used by the flanker family of multi-role fighters. Again, the Yakont outranges the SM-6. Even a flight of naval fighters operating above a task force would prevent these kinds of standoff tactics, meaning incoming strike packages will have to be heavily supported by electronic warfare assets and escorting fighters, drastically complicating the enemy's tactical picture and challenge generally. As I hope is now quite clear, Providing a task force with fighter cover is not simply some prestige capability designed to excite politicians and civilians. Rather, in a wider strategic environment where supersonic, sea-skimming anti-ship cruise missiles are widely proliferating and the Australian military is once again preparing to wage a high-end naval battle against a very well-equipped foe, it is a fundamental defensive requirement. One of the most important lessons of the Falklands War 
was the primacy of defence in depth when being engaged by the anti-ship cruise missile. Having an outfield fighter defence is a critical element in any effective ASCM defensive complex, and despite their small numbers, the Sea Harrier was an absolutely vital component in what turned out to be a very narrowly won British victory. I would argue that in any high-end threat environment, including a general regional conflict with the PLA, unless an RAN task force can be provided with fighter and airborne ISR cover, it cannot be independently deployed. That is, by any realistic measure, a serious capability shortfall. There are two primary lines of argument advanced by the anti stovel faction, which contend that this capability gap is not actually a major problem, and certainly not one that justifies investment in the F-35B or fixed-wing naval aviation generally. The first is the use of land-based air power. Why do we need naval aviation if we have a land-based air force? Can't we just use tankers to extend the range of our F-35A fleet and provide fighter cover to a task force operating in Australia's wider region? And if we need to move further afield, surely we can find a friendly airbase somewhere. This is the solution currently being used by the ADF, and unfortunately, it is not a good one. Before we get into a specific rebuttal of this point, this argument immediately raises the question, if one can simply use land bases to provide naval forces with fighter cover, then why do so many powers invest in aircraft carriers? Take the United States. The US military has a global basing infrastructure, the most powerful air force and the largest tanker fleet in the world. The USAF alone has some 490 tanker aircraft. Yet, despite the apparent global reach of its air force, it still invested in 11 100,000 ton nuclear powered supercarriers. Why would it invest that much into such valuable carriers, which then have to be protected and sustained, if land based air power was a good substitute for naval aviation? Why would Russia, China, India, the United Kingdom, France, Japan, and even middle powers like Spain, Turkey, and Italy invest in aircraft carriers if they could simply find a friendly airbase somewhere? Doesn't the exact same argument apply to them as well? The stark reality is, Australia is the only maritime power that has a major blue water power projection capability and does not have an aircraft carrier. The reason why land-based air power is a very poor substitute for naval aviation can be summed up by the statement that proximity equals capability. As you project your forces further and further from their supporting bases, this has a dramatically negative impact on platform efficiency. This is caused by transit time. In order to sustain a fighter presence, you have to continually have platforms moving to and from the cap location. Basically, just to keep four F-35As orbiting above a task force 1200 nautical miles away, we would probably need to allocate an entire fighter squadron, even with tanker support. The same logic applies to allocating an E-7 wedge tail to the task force. You would need between two to three to provide it with constant ISR cover, depending upon the range. The RAAF only has six wedge tails in total. This may be all well and good if the RAAF has nothing else to do, but in the event of a general regional conflict, or even the less likely eventuality of a bilateral conflict with a regional power, the Air Force will have a continent to defend, in addition to all of its offensive missions. In reality, this is only realistic in the most permissive of scenarios, akin to Interfet. But what about friendly airfields and forward operating bases? Well, the use of friendly bases is wholly dependent upon the good graces of foreign governments who will be highly incentivized to stay neutral in any major conflict. For example, during the Falklands, despite their very friendly relations all throughout the region, the United Kingdom had to rely exclusively on the bases under its physical control, such as Ascension Island. Even the closest of treaty allies, such as the United States, remained neutral throughout the war. If we now imagine a possible conflict with China, can we reasonably expect minor regional powers to allow the RAAF to utilize their bases and risk being treated as a co-belligerent by Beijing? That seems to be a very insecure assumption upon which to base our force structure decisions. American planners certainly do not expect their participation in such a contingency. In any case, 
These forward operating bases are well within the reach of the PLA's vast tactical ballistic missile arsenal, and thus may not be tenable in any case. The simple reality is, the best way to provide fighter and airborne ISR cover to a deployed task force is to ensure that those capabilities are organic. This was as true in 1943 as it is in 2023. As we can see, relying purely on land-based air power to mitigate this capability gap is, at best, a poor solution. But this leads us to the second argument advanced against naval aviation. Canberra has allies, and the thought of Australia taking on a great power like China alone is literally unthinkable. Thus, in such a high-end scenario, the RAN will be able to rely upon the air cover provided by allied carrier forces. In a lower end, regional scenario, where the ADF could feasibly operate alone, the threat will be so low that naval aviation simply won't be required. Or so the thinking goes. To put it succinctly, this is a fallacious argument. It constitutes nothing more than a false dichotomy, deliberately ignoring the numerous and highly plausible scenarios which sit in between these two extremes. The first major flaw in this reasoning is it ignores the fact that defence planners tend to be bad at forecasting the requirements of future conflict, especially when they are under pressure to mitigate cost and limit capability. The Falklands is a crystalline example of this kind of hubris. Exactly the same arguments were advanced about the British military in the 1970s. Britain was a NATO ally and no longer a global power and thus its navy should be optimised for sea line of communication defence in the North Atlantic. This led to a corrosion of core Royal Navy warfighting capabilities, carrier aviation first and foremost, one that almost cost them the Falklands. That is not to argue that the Australian military needs to be prepared to fight the Falklands War, but only that we should be very careful in allowing core defensive capabilities to be jettisoned because we believe we can perfectly predict the RAN's future warfighting requirements. For example, a significant strategic divergence between Canberra and Washington in a regional contingency, not including China, should not be treated as impossible. The second major flaw in this reasoning is it assumes that, in the event of a general regional conflict with China, just because we will be fighting within a wider alliance, that our allies will have the assets available to provide ADF task forces with air cover. But the simple reality is we no longer live in the unipolar moment where US naval power was overwhelming. China is an emergent superpower, and in any conflict, the Western allies will be hard-pressed everywhere. The notion that the British or Americans will automatically have a spare carrier strike group available which can provide an RAN task force with the basic defensive capabilities it currently lacks is the height of presumption. That is peacetime thinking. Furthermore, given the fact that Australia's major allies, the United States and Britain, have a global force posture, while the Chinese military is concentrated in the region, the Western allies will almost surely face an initial period of force ratio disadvantage simultaneously making all Allied naval assets already in the theatre more valuable and further reducing the likelihood that the 7th Fleet will have a spare carrier to lend us. The Japanese will assuredly have their hands full in North Asia. The ADF has a highly potent amphibious capability. Given the archipelagic maritime geography over which any conflict with China will be fought, such a capability will be of enormous value especially in the vital opening phases when Allied forces are likely to be outnumbered. But, because of the glaring holes outlined here, unless a better equipped ally can come and hold our hand, Australia's capital ships may well have to remain in port. In essence, the inability to provide RAN task forces with organic air cover dramatically reduces their operational flexibility and therefore utility in any general regional conflict. No one is arguing that the ADF should be prepared to sail into the South China Sea and take on the PLA alone, but the inability to provide the basic elements of anti-ship cruise missile defence means that, to our allies, the RAN's amphibious and surface forces may end up being a liability rather than an asset, diverting their precious capabilities away from other missions and priorities. The final weakness in this line of argument is that it engages in special pleading. After all, couldn't we apply precisely the same logic to many other capabilities that are currently fielded 
by the RAN and ADF as a whole. If the only time Australian warships are going to be engaging in a high-end naval battle is within a wider alliance, then do we really need a Hobart-class destroyer? Surely the expense of Aegis, Spy-1, DNSM-2 can't be justified if every time Australian warships are headed into harm's way, they will be embedded in a USN carrier strike group, where they will be operating under its wider fighter and missile umbrella? An Anzac-class frigate is surely sufficient for any regional scenario. Couldn't the same argument be made for nuclear submarines, considering the USN's vast SSN fleet? As you can see, the logic is plainly identical, and the fact that many within the Australian strategic community only apply it to naval aviation is a crystalline example of the kind of bad faith, fallacious reasoning that dominates much of this discussion. None of this is to say that there are not, in fact, good arguments against using the F-35B in ADF service. The first is cost. An ideal force structure would probably include the addition of a dedicated Stovall carrier such as the Izumo class and a fleet air arm squadron of 24 F-35Bs. Upfront acquisition costs could well be in the $10 billion range, not including the significant personnel and sustainment costs associated with such a substantial increase in the ADF's order of battle. After all, aircraft carriers tend to be personnel intensive. With an annual budget in excess of $50 billion, the ADF could afford this if it chose to prioritise the capability. But this would have to come at the cost of something else, and right now the Australian military is undergoing one of the largest peacetime expansions in its history. Space, cyber, intelligence, long-range strike, nuclear submarines, hypersonics, hypersonic and ballistic missile defence, all of these areas are fighting for investment over and above the ADF's more traditional capability requirements. The money has to come from somewhere. Even the more affordable Stovall option, which I explored in another discussion, comes with significant opportunity costs. The force structure outlined there envisaged replacing HMAS tools with a third LHD and converting the LHD fleet into multi-role configuration, akin to the One Colors One or TCG Anadolu, allowing the fleet to be mission configured for either amphibious or aviation operations. The Super Hornets of Number One Squadron would then be replaced with F-35Bs. Number One Squadron would follow the British military's Joint Force Harrier concept, operating from both land bases and ships depending upon the requirement. This force structure would not require any additional ships or squadrons, and thus would not be overly costly from a procurement or sustainment perspective. As the force would be mission configurable, no amphibious capability would be lost, and with three LHDs there would always be a vessel available to meet the Army, Navy and Air Force's annual training requirements. This is how many other navies utilise their LHDs, and would allow the amphibious force to be scaled to meet your specific need. Although a Canberra-class LHD is not a true carrier, it would constitute a floating, austere forward operating base, one that could certainly sustain F-35B operations for a number of weeks. But even this force structure imposes serious opportunity costs. If we compare the F-35B to the F-35A, when not operating from an LHD or forward operating base, it is simply worse in every way. It has less payload, a smaller combat radius, is kinematically inferior, and costs 20% more. But what if we compare the F-35B to other potential options? After all, we don't have to buy additional F-35As. The F-A-18F fleet will be ready for retirement by 2030, by which time the next generation air dominance program will have fielded the 6th generation fighter which is currently in development. In terms of aggregate combat capability, whatever the next generation air dominance program eventually produces, we can be sure it will make the F-35B look like a sea harrier. Is it worth forgoing that kind of stealth, range, lethality and precision for Stobel? Or what if the Super Hornets were replaced with a 12 strong squadron of B-21 Raiders? an acquisition many in the Australian strategic community have been advocating over the last few months. Moreover, the chief of the RAAF, Robert Chipman, attended the aircraft's unveiling, and when American officials have been questioned about a potential sale to Australia, they have certainly not been dismissive of the idea. Although this would require export approval, this is something that should seem all the more plausible given the AUKUS pact. The B-21 would revolutionise the ADF's strategic strike maritime strike, and power projection capabilities. 
it is truly a conventional offensive capability like no other. When one calculates the opportunity cost of foregoing a B-21 in favour of the F-35B, all of a sudden the Stovall option starts to look very expensive indeed. As much as it may not seem like it, I am not actually advocating the purchase of the F-35B here. What I am championing is a more balanced evaluation of both the costs and the benefits this capability represents, rather than the kind of hatchet jobs produced by ASPI and the groupthink that dominates the forums. The plain reality is, the lack of organic, fixed-wing naval aviation is a very significant weakness in the current mix of capabilities deployed by the Royal Australian Navy and ADF as a whole. With the advent of supersonic, sea-skimming anti-ship cruise missiles, distributed battle networks and over-the-horizon capable active radar homing surface-to-air missiles, naval aviation is actually becoming more important in the 21st century than it was in the late 20th, even for medium-sized navies. Another obvious and unequivocal truth is, no matter what you or I believe about the merits of the F-35B in Australian service, the ADF is simply not interested. A cursory evaluation was conducted under the Abbott government, which rejected the F-35B option, and the 2016 Defence White Paper and 2020 Strategic Update contain no mention of the platform. HMAS Chules will not be replaced by a third Canberra-class LHD. Under Project C-2200, Chules will be replaced by a pair of multi-role tanker transports called the Joint Support Ship. These vessels will be able to act as logistic support ships with a large roll-on, roll-off deck, tankers with large fuel storage that can replenish vessels at sea, and potentially a well deck to support amphibious operations. Various proposals range in size from 15 to nearly 40,000 tonnes. These will be very useful vessels indeed simultaneously increasing the RAN's amphibious capability and aiding in fleet sustainment, but they certainly will not facilitate Stovall operations. Whether we think they are making the right choice or not, it now seems crystal clear that the F-35B in Australian service is simply a concept which is dead on arrival. Unless there is a radical shift in thinking across the ADF and political class, it is simply not going to happen. But what does any of this have to do with the MQ-28, I hear you ask? Well, the good news is that almost all of the critical capability shortfalls that have been illuminated here can be addressed by a navalized ghost bat. The even better news is that doing so imposes essentially none of the major downsides of the F-35B, especially in terms of force structure distortion and opportunity cost, and all at a fraction of the upfront cost. The MQ-28 is no F-35B, and it certainly can't replace all of the impressive suite of capabilities the Lightning II provides, but by leveraging the modularity of the Ghost Bat, we can cobble together some of the most important sensors and weapons, especially if multiple UAVs are used, addressing both the offensive and defensive capability shortfalls. Let's use a hypothetical example to illustrate how a small number of navalized MQ-28s can be used to greatly increase the survivability of an Australian task force. It's 2032, and we are in a full-blown conventional conflict with China centred on Taiwan. In response to a Chinese invasion of the island, Australia, the United States and Japan have intervened militarily, and high-intensity naval and air battle is being waged across the Indo-Pacific. In response to the imposition of a far blockade of Chinese shipping by the Allies, the PLAN has declared unrestricted submarine warfare in the eastern Indian and western Pacific Oceans, with the objective of interdicting the sea lines of communication linking critical US allies, Japan and Australia, with their sources of essential imports, especially liquid fuels. The majority of Australia's energy imports transit the eastern Indian Ocean, and the PLAN has deployed a number of attack submarines into the area, both the Yuan-class SSK and one or two Shang-class SSNs. In response, the RAN has deployed a hunter-killer ASW group, composed of the destroyer HMAS Hobart, the frigates HMAS Hunter and HMAS Ballarat, and the LHD HMAS Canberra, which is being used as a helicopter carrier. On board Canberra are eight MH-60 Romeo anti-submarine warfare helicopters, which augment the three that are on board the other warships. 
As the group is patrolling 500 nautical miles to the north of the Cocos Killing Islands, it successfully engages a number of hostile submarines, sinking two. The powerful concentration of ASW assets, especially when supplemented by a P-8 Poseidon operating from Cocos Killing Air Base, poses a deadly threat to any submarine unlucky enough to come across its path, with each contact swarmed by up to three dipping sonar-equipped MH-60 Romeos. With this group now posing a serious threat to Chinese submarine operations, PLA South Seas Fleet Command, acting as the Southern Theatre Joint Command Centre, decides to strike the task force. Its movements are regularly detected by satellite passes, but these are intermittent and the wider Yaogan satellite constellation is being disrupted by American anti-satellite capabilities, making its coverage even more patchy. Four radar satellites and three imaging systems have already been destroyed by SM-3 strikes. This is severely degrading the anti-ship ballistic missile kill chain, as the PLA's wider operational level battle network is being subjected to an intense blinding campaign. In any case, the Australian task force is well outside of DF-21D range, and the PLA's precious DF-26 arsenal is being directed at USN carrier strike groups. Thus, PLA Command decides to employ a maritime strike package. In order to fix the Australian task force, a WZ-7 Soaring Dragon high-altitude long-endurance drone is dispatched, and within hours it locates the formation. Without organic fighter cover, there is nothing to stop the WZ-7 from simply shadowing the task force, using its long-range synthetic aperture radar system to provide a firing solution for YJ-18-equipped PLAN submarines and YJ-12-equipped PLAAF maritime strike platforms all of which can launch their weapons from well beyond Hobart's SM-6 range. The formation is simply too far away from the RAAF's fighter-capable bases to be provided with F-35A cover. In any case, the RAAF is fully committed defending its northern bases from long-range air attack and striking targets in the South China Sea. Unless something can be done to shake the drone, Chinese submarines and bombers will be able to conduct a coordinated standoff supersonic anti-ship cruise missile attack, one that could very plausibly saturate the task force's missile defences. But HMAS Canberra is not only carrying eight Seahawks. Parked inside her light vehicle deck are eight navalized MQ-28Bs. As the task force sails to the northwest, a single ghost bat orbits the formation at 30,000 feet. It has been equipped with an AESA radar nose section comparable to the AN APG-81. With a range of 2,000 nautical miles and an average cruise speed of 400 knots, a single MQ-28 can remain airborne for about 5 hours, meaning 3 can provide the task force with constant airborne radar coverage. Using Link-16, as the drone completes in orbit, it data links its radar picture to the Aegis combat system on board HMAS Hobart. At 30,000 feet, the radar horizon has been expanded to 218 nautical miles for sea-skimming targets, which is more than the radar's range for something as small as a missile. Standing some 30 metres tall, the AN-SPQ-9B Horizon Search Radar can only detect the target flying at an altitude of 5 metres at a range of some 17 nautical miles, meaning a single ghost bat has extended the radar horizon by an order of magnitude. To limit visibility, the surface warships keep their main air search radars on standby, relying on passive systems to warn them of an incoming missile. The large and unstealthy drone is detected by the ghost bat at 150 nautical miles. As it approaches the formation, two more MQ-28s depart Canberra. Configured for air defence, these two drones are each armed with a pair of AIM-120D medium-range air-to-air missiles. As the radar-equipped ghost bat tracks the target, targeting information is data-linked to the missile-armed drones, and within minutes, the WZ-7 is cartwheeling out of the sky its left wing torn off by a close proximity AMRAAM detonation. Undeterred, South Seas Fleet Headquarters orders a long-range maritime strike package to attack the task force. The Australian group is only one of over 20 Allied formations that the PLA has detected in the Indian and Western Pacific areas, including three carrier strike groups, and the PLAAF's long-range bomber fleet is heavily engaged striking targets in Taiwan, Guam and Japan. Still, the PLA managed to allocate a single squadron of H-6K bombers to attack the Canberra task force. Armed with a pair of YJ-12 supersonic anti-ship cruise missiles each, 
the 12 bombers depart their airbase on Hainan Island. The loss of the WZ-7 gave PLA command an approximate location of the formation, and an optical imaging satellite should pass the target area about halfway through the three and a half hour flight. This should reduce the area of uncertainty somewhat, but in order to fix the location of the Australian task force, the bombers are preceded by a pair of Y-8FQ maritime patrol aircraft. The departure of the bombers is detected by an allied electronic intelligence satellite. Their voice communications are again detected as they meet tanker aircraft over the South China Sea. US Pacific Command transmits a raid warning to ADF Headquarters Joint Operations Command, which then informs Canberra. Forewarned of the incoming air raid and given an approximate time of arrival, four MQ-28s are launched from HMAS Canberra. Each is armed with a pair of AMRAMs. Two are equipped with fire control radars, the others with infrared search and track systems. As the bombers approach the target area, the two Y-8s don't see any air search radars. One detects what it thinks might be a fighter fire control radar, but cannot re-establish contact. Worried it may have been a low probability of intercept AESA radar, the crew radios a warning to the bombers. However, they are still 500 nautical miles to the north of the target location. Just moments later, alarms scream into life aboard the H-6s as their radar warning receivers detect the active radar seeker of an AMRAM. This is a bomber pilot's worst nightmare. Not knowing how many incoming missiles there are, the Chinese formation immediately becomes defensive, jettisoning their heavy YJ-12s and diving for the deck, leaving behind a cloud of chaff. One H-6 is unable to escape, an AMRAM detonating just five metres behind it, shredding its tail. Heavily damaged, the big bomber limps back north. Forewarned of the incoming air raid, the bomber force was ambushed by the stealthy Australian drones, which were pre-positioned to the task forces north. Although only one bomber was damaged by the maximum range, low-energy AMRAM shots, the entire formation was mission-killed. As we can see, even this extremely limited amount of organic fighter cover drastically complicates the tactical picture facing any maritime strike package. With a combat radius approaching a thousand nautical miles, simply standing off is no longer a realistic possibility. Subsonic, long-range bombers like the H-6 now need to be escorted by fighters, limiting the practical range of the bomber to its escort. After the abortive air raid, the Canberra Task Force continues its patrol, moving southeast towards a long-range sonar contact. An Allied submarine has reported what appeared to be a Type 93 Shang-class SSN. As the task force moved towards the target location, a small vessel was detected shadowing the formation. HMAS Ballarat approached the unknown vessel, which appeared to be a Thai fishing boat. The sailors aboard waved at the approaching Australian warship as it was warned by radio not to approach the task force. As Ballarat departed the area, the vessel resumed its course, keeping contact with the Australian warships. Although suspicions were raised, the rules of engagement prevented the task force from taking any action against a neutral ship unless it posed a direct threat to Australian vessels or personnel. Worried their position was being relayed to Beijing as they approached a dangerous nuclear submarine, Canberra's captain decided to improve his situational awareness. In addition to the single ghost bat acting as an AWACS, another drone was launched this time with an infrared search and track nose section. A little over an hour later, alarms screech inside the operations room of HMAS Hobart. The tactical interface of the Aegis display system showed the dreaded symbol of incoming missiles. Flying at 10,000 feet above the formation, the second ghost bat detected six massive infrared signatures, low and some 60 nautical miles from the task force. These were YJ-18s. Based on the Russian 3M54E Club, the YJ-18 is the most dangerous Chinese supersonic anti-ship cruise missile. After cruising to the target area at subsonic speed, the missile jettisons its sustainer section and a solid rocket motor accelerates the weapon to Mark III, its massive engine plume revealing its presence to the airborne infrared search and track system. Going that fast, 2,000 knots, the missiles will reach their targets in some 110 seconds. Provided with targeting data from the civilian trawler, which was actually a Chinese intelligence vessel, the Han was able to launch the missile volley from standoff range, 120 nautical miles. Immediately, Hobart orders the AWACS Ghost Bat, 
which happened to be facing in the other direction as it made its orbit, to conduct a radar scan of the area, and within 10 seconds, the Aegis combat system had tracks on all six missiles. 100 seconds left. Hobart is blanketed in a thick cloud of smoke as six SM-6 missiles leave her Mark 41 VLS complex over a four-second period, the Mark 72 booster section accelerating the missile to Mark 3. The SM-6 missiles meet the YJ-18s halfway, with three successful intercepts at 30 nautical miles. As Hobart's SM-6s were screaming downrange, the Aegis combat system on board HMAS Hunter tracked the incoming vampires its targeting data relayed from Hobart through cooperative engagement capability. She launches another six active radar homing SM-2 Block 3C missiles. These reach the YJ-18s at 20 nautical miles, successfully hitting two more, just one left. With just 32 seconds before impact, the final Chinese missile appears over the radar horizon. Placing herself between the threat and HMAS Canberra, the CFAR-2 radar on board Ballarat picks up the incoming missile at 18 nautical miles. She fires three ESSM Block II medium-range surface-to-air missiles, and the YJ-18 is brought down at just seven nautical miles from the Australian formation. Without the increased sense of footprint provided by the Ghost Bats, the task force would have only detected the incoming missile salvo at 18 nautical miles, giving the defences just over 30 seconds to detect the threat, classify it, generate a firing solution, and then launch its missiles. Quite a daunting challenge. Now imagine there are 20 incoming YJ-18s, as opposed to 6. But it's not just in the area of fleet defence that a navalised ghost bat would be of great utility to the RAN. They would also be highly useful in supporting amphibious operations. In terms of throw weight and firepower, an MQ-28 is no replacement for an AH-64E Apache Guardian, attack helicopters that will be adorning the RAN's flat tops from 2025. But no matter how advanced an attack helicopter is, as we have seen in Ukraine, they are much less survivable when facing capable ground-based air defense systems. Russia has faced very significant helicopter attrition, with over a quarter of the Ka-50 fleet lost to enemy action. This may not matter in the event of a low to medium intensity scenario, where the ADF would be deploying its forces to stabilize a failed state in Oceania, for example, simply because the ground-based air defense threat is so low. But what about in a high-end scenario? What if the ADF was tasked with taking a PLA forward operating base in Indonesia or the Pacific, and the United States didn't have a spare supercarrier to lend us? Any such PLA unit will certainly be defended by capable surface-to-air missile systems such as the HQ-16, which is a Chinese book derivative, or at the worst case, a very long-range HQ-9, which is development of the S-300 family. We should also expect the Point Defense HQ-11, which will be especially dangerous to low-flying aircraft. These systems would seriously compromise the ability of the Australian amphibious force to use its helicopters, a critical component of the force considering the Apache is the primary form of close air support. Because of its speed, low signature and weapons, the MQ-28 would give the task force a realistic suppression of enemy air defense capability. Armed with the SDB-2 Stormbreaker, a Ghost Bat would be more than capable of engaging these surface-to-air missile systems. When configured for reconnaissance and electronic surveillance, the MQ-28 could locate these hostile radar systems. It can also strike them, Although not as stealthy as an F-35, the Ghost Bat should easily be able to approach to Stormbreaker maximum range, which is some 110 kilometers or 60 nautical miles for a high altitude launch and a stationary target. The Stormbreaker can then use an imaging infrared seeker and millimeter wave active radar to identify the target vehicle. With these highly dangerous surface-to-air missile systems suppressed, the threat to helicopter operations would be reduced to manpad systems. Alternatively, when configured in reconnaissance mode with infrared sensors or synthetic aperture radars, the stealthy MQ-28 could provide a firing solution for precision surface-to-surface missiles, such as HIMARS, which can then be used to strike the same targets. This same reconnaissance and strike capability is useful in areas other than suppression of enemy air defense. Although its throw weight is tiny, the extreme precision and versatility of the Stormbreaker allow the Ghost Bat to strike a number of highly valuable targets. As the Ukrainian military demonstrated with the employment of the far less capable T-34 
TB2 Bay Rectar during the opening phases of the war, these drones can be used to effectively strike critical capabilities, such as command vehicles, ammunition dumps, or even aircraft on the ground. They can also be used for close air support. Again, although the firepower of a single MQ-28 is tiny, this is offset by the precision of the Stormbreaker. It could certainly be used to strike individual tanks or even guided by laser to hit enemy strong points, such as bunkers. Undoubtedly, you can use attack helicopters to do the same thing, and no one is arguing that the Ghost Bat should replace the Apache, but the two platforms would constitute a formidable team. The Apache could even direct the MQ-28 through Link-16, a capability already demonstrated with the integration of the MQ-1C Grey Eagle. Finally, and just in more general terms, having a stealthy, 2,000 nautical mile ranged Stormbreaker armed drone operational with the fleet would allow the amphibious force to strike high value targets all throughout the battle space. The Ghostback could also provide the force with some basic air defense capability, and its role as an ISR asset could well be described as a game changer. Truly, it would be a phenomenal force multiplier for the amphibious force as a whole. Obviously, the F-35B would do all of the same things, only much better. However, the Ghostback comes with almost none of the downsides. Although the Canberra class can, with some minor modifications, support F-35B operations, it isn't big enough to do so with significant amphibious forces embarked, meaning it has to be configured either as a carrier or as an amphibious assault ship. The MQ-28, on the other hand, is a tiny platform. When fully assembled, it is 11 metres long and 7 metres wide. However, even in its current land-based form, the wings and nose can be removed for storage, at which point the Ghost Bat is just 3 metres wide and 8 metres long. You could easily store a pair in a single helicopter spot. An Apache is 5 metres wide. Even when full to the brim with tanks, vehicles and army personnel, the Canberra class has 990 metres squared of dedicated hangar space. When disassembled, a single MQ-28 consumes about 25.5 square metres. When packed tightly together, six will take up less than one-sixth of the total hangar space, some 153 square metres or about 15%. The wings and nose sections can be stored in a 40-foot container. Thus, even if we just use the hangar, the LHD could comfortably house six medium-sized helicopters and four to six ghost bats. But this ignores deck parking. There is ample deck parking space to the front and rear of the island, probably enough to store six MQ-28s without wings or with wings folded. Thus, we could probably take four to six ghost bats and still deploy our eight helicopters if we really had to. In terms of mass, the ghost bat weighs less than three tons empty meaning it will have a negligible impact on buoyancy or stability. One of the major objections that is often raised in opposition to using the F-35B on the Canberra class is its lack of fuel bunkerage. This is despite the fact that, as far as I can tell, the RAN has not publicly disclosed how much aviation fuel bunkerage the Canberra class actually has. The Yuan Carlos I carries over 800 tonnes of JP-5, and civilian journalists have cited Canberra's aviation fuel capacity as 1 million litres, which is about 800 tonnes. Some have argued that the Canberra was designed with less and thus cannot support F-35 operations, but in my experience, these arguments cannot be supported with any open source citations, any of which I have found indicate that Canberra has the same aviation fuel bunkerage as Yuan Colos 1. Whatever Canberra's actual fuel bunkerage is, it is clearly enough to support the operations of a full squadron of helicopters for an extended period, and whether it is enough to sustain F-35B operations or not, this simply isn't a problem for the MQ-28. The F-35B has a maximum internal fuel volume of just over 6 tonnes, or 13,500 pounds. We don't know how much fuel the MQ-28 can carry internally, but if we assume a reasonably typical fuel fraction of 0.3, that would bring us to approximately 1 tonne, or 2,200 pounds, which is basically identical to how much internal fuel a UH-60 Blackhawk uses. If the Canberra does have the same bunkerage as Yuan Carlos one which it probably does, considering needlessly changing the internal layout of the fuel bunkers would add cost 
and significantly impact the vessel's stability, requiring a substantial redesign, all for a trivial increase in usable internal volume, then HMAS Canberra can sustain over 800 MQ-28A sorties without requiring refueling. Even if we halve that number, we are still talking 400 sorties. To put it simply, the highly dubious arguments about Canberra's fuel bunkers are simply not relevant to the Ghost Bat. If you can operate helicopters, then you clearly have enough fuel to support the MQ-28. All of this discussion omits the minor detail of what, precisely, would a navalized MQ-28 constitute. The navalization of an aircraft is not typically a trivial matter. Generally speaking, there are often numerous design changes that are required to allow the platform to survive the punishing maritime environment. Materials need to be adapted to enhance corrosion resistance, especially if one envisages parking these aircraft on the deck for days on end. Additionally, landing on a ship tends to be a little more punishing than a typical airfield, and thus more substantial landing gear and, potentially, a stronger airframe may be required. This navalized MQ-28 could plausibly either use Stovall or Stobar to facilitate naval operations. Stovall, meaning short takeoff but vertical landing, would require the greatest redesign of the aircraft but minimal alterations to the Canberra. There would be significant cost and risk in developing a Stovall variant, which would require a much more powerful engine, but this is an aircraft technology that has been in existence for over 50 years. Boeing has extensive experience with Stovall fighters through both its X-32 and its merger with McDonnell Douglas, so there is plenty of institutional knowledge with which Boeing Australia could leverage when it comes to a Stobble design. Perhaps a more simple solution is a Stobar configuration, which stands for Short Takeoff Barrier Assisted Recovery. In this arrangement, the aircraft uses a ski jump to facilitate a short takeoff, but then uses a rest of wires to land. Although the Canberra does not have an angled flight deck, it actually doesn't need one for this to work. There are other users of the Yuan Carlos One platform that are intending to launch high-performance UAVs in the MQ-28 class. The Turkish military ordered the TCG Anadolu in 2015, and the vessel is currently undergoing sea trials. A very close cousin of the Canberra class, the Anadolu shares her basic size and layout, with the same sized flight deck, internal hangar, heavy and light vehicle deck, and almost identical dimensions. In a similar fashion to the operational concept I discussed earlier, from its initial order the Turkish military was intending to utilize the Anadolu as a multi-purpose warship, which could be quickly configured as a Stovall carrier or as an amphibious assault ship depending upon Ankara's requirements. Along with the planned F-35A purchase, the Turks were intending to acquire a number of F-35Bs for use on the vessel. However, in response to Turkey's purchase of the S-400 missile system, Ankara was barred by the US Senate from purchasing any F-35s. But this hasn't crushed Turkey's aspirations for naval air power. The vessel will now field a number of Turkish unmanned combat air vehicles. In addition to the propeller-driven Bayraktar TB-3, which is comparable to a Reaper, the Turkish Navy will deploy the much more capable Bayraktar Kizilema, or Red Apple. The Kizilema is a jet-powered, stealthy, high-performance UAV that is in many ways comparable to the Ghost Bat. It is significantly larger, with a max takeoff weight of some 6 tonnes, a total length of 14.7 metres and a 10 metre wingspan. It has a payload of 1,500 kilograms. The Kizilema will use Anadolu's ski jump to conduct a short takeoff. When recovering the drone, the Anadolu will use a set of arrestor wires at the back of the ship. Just like a Super Hornet on a Ford class carrier, the Kizilema will use a hook to grab one of these wires, bringing it to a halt. If the hook bounces or it misses a wire, the drone will conduct another short takeoff and come around again. This is absolutely a cost-effective solution that could be applied to the Canberra class. Compared to a Stobble variant, this would only necessitate a minimal redesign to the MQ-28A, requiring only a moderate increase in thrust and perhaps an alteration in the wing design. It would, however, mean some significant modification to the Canberra class, specifically the installation of arrestor gear. There is enough room for a set of arrestor wires just forward of the aft elevator and behind the number 6 landing spot, which should not compromise helicopter operations. Certainly, given the fact that we literally operate the same platform, 
and very similar UAVs, there is a real opportunity for collaboration with the Turkish military. They are currently developing a technical solution which will work on the Canberra class and is designed to recover drones that are larger and heavier than the Ghost Bat. Collaboration on this capability is an obvious opportunity for the ADF. As this discussion has hopefully illuminated, the lack of naval aviation is a serious capability gap within the ADF's current force structure, one that can be readily addressed by unmanned systems. The cost and risk of developing a navalized MQ-28 are not trivial, but neither are they insurmountable. Given how inexpensive the Ghost Bat is, even if a navalized variant required $1 billion of research and development, which is much more than has been spent on the program as a whole to date, and had an upfront cost of $10 million per copy, it would still represent excellent value. Even if all the MQ-28 did was provide an RAN task force with airborne ISR coverage, it would be worth it. But when you consider just how versatile this little drone is, its ability to engage airborne threats, to shoot down hostile UAVs and MPAs, the way it provides limited outfield fighter defense, complicating maritime strikes significantly, its utility as a tactical reconnaissance asset for deployed amphibious forces, its use in the seed, precision strike, and even close air support roles when combined with the Stormbreaker, the opportunity here is glaringly self-evident. Hell, the Ghost Bat can even conduct limited maritime strike with the SDV-2. Because of how small its footprint is, both in terms of storage and fuel, even a more powerful, navalized MQ-28 would be able to operate with the LHDs whilst the full amphibious ready group was embarked, providing the amphibious force with critical capabilities that currently have to be staged from land bases. The Ghost Bat will be just as useful when the Canberra is being used in other roles, such as a helicopter carrier. No, it certainly isn't a replacement for the F-35B, and there are many high-end offensive roles that cannot be undertaken without a full-blown fifth-generation strike fighter not to mention the Lightning's ability to wage a high-end defensive outer air battle, but this little drone is much better than nothing. Just as the MQ-28 expands the sensor footprint and missile engagement range of the RAAF's fighters, acting as an extension of these manned platforms, so could it do the same for the RAN's warships. Empowered by Link-16, cooperative engagement capability and SM-6, a radar-equipped Ghost Bat would liberate the RAN from the tyranny of the radar horizon, allowing for the long-range engagement of incoming missiles, greatly mitigating the deadly supersonic sea-skimming anti-ship cruise missile threat. That capability alone probably justifies the investment. Perhaps one of the most important elements of the MQ-28 program is not actually the aircraft itself, but its wider impact on Australia's military-industrial complex. One of the most important features of the program as a whole is the amount of local industry participation, which will have two serious strategic benefits. The first is a sovereign production line. Obviously, local manufacture of defence equipment has economic benefits, creating jobs and stimulating economic activity, which has wider ramifications throughout the economy via the multiplier effect. But there is a real, strategic rationale for a local production line. As we saw in the dark days of 1942, relying purely on foreign armed suppliers can be highly problematic for a nation like Australia. In the event of a general regional conflict, the RAAF will look to rapidly expand its order of battle, plausibly increasing its F-35A force to 300 or even 500 platforms. But it may well take years for Australia to receive these systems from US production lines, which will struggle to rapidly increase their productive capacity. The F-35 is an extremely complex machine. The supporting supply chain includes 1,800 US companies which produce parts. Although, in time of war, this production can be diversified, there will still be bottlenecks. The number of companies that can produce its stealthy coating, for example, is highly limited. Thus, it will take a significant amount of time to increase the number of F-35s rolling off the Palmdale production line. We can also expect the USAF, USMC and USN to be prioritised for any increased F-35 production. But with an MQ-28 production line operational in Brisbane, wholly supported by a local supply chain, the Australian government will have the ability to scale local production to meet its requirements. Not only that, but the Australian military can be prioritised for deliveries. 
This is the critical advantage of sovereign defense production. Critical capabilities the ADF needs will not be held at ransom by foreign governments, which will rightfully look to meet their own requirements first. Additionally, given how relatively simple the MQ-28 is, scaling up production would be comparatively easy. Thus, while the RAAF waits for its new F-35s, dozens of MQ-28s could be delivered each month, rapidly and cheaply increasing the ADF's aggregate air warfare capability. Again, these are no replacement for an F-35, but having large numbers of ghost bats would go a very long way to rapidly putting the RAAF on a war footing. The other major strategic implication of domestic development and production of unmanned air systems is the possibility of future platforms. The MQ-28 is a highly versatile little drone, but it is quite limited, especially in terms of payload. Nonetheless, once the critical core systems of the Ghost Bat have been developed, specifically the flight control computers, navigation, communications, and autonomous command and control elements, these systems can serve as the foundation for more capable drones. After all, as an aircraft, the MQ-28 is hardly that remarkable. It's the AI that makes it special, and this can be used as the foundation for a family of unmanned systems once it is developed. One of the core capability objectives being pursued by the Australian government is a concept often called impactful projection, in which the ADF will be able to impose meaningful costs on an enemy at a very long range from Australia. The ability to conduct very long range strike at intercontinental distances is now a capability that is actively being pursued by the ADF, which has driven the requirement for nuclear submarines, hypersonic cruise missiles, and talk of strategic air power. However, as it currently stands, the RAAF's strategic strike capability is limited to the F-35A. Could an MQ-28 derivative help bridge this capability gap? Let's imagine we took the MQ-28's brain, these core computers and electronic systems, and placed it in a more capable airframe. What if we simply scaled up an MQ-28, making a larger variant with greater range, air-to-air -air refueling capability, and a two-ton payload? Everything else would remain the same. This new variant would be just as stealthy, have the same kinematic performance, and still use commercial engines. We have just given it a 2,000 nautical mile combat radius and a larger payload. Certainly, this would not be an expensive aircraft, nor would it be difficult to develop. All we are talking about here is a big ghost bat. Well, what if we took this super ghost bat and equipped it with the 750 nautical mile ranged JASSM XR standoff land attack missile? Now we have an unmanned aerial vehicle that can autonomously fly from RAAF Darwin and strike Shanghai without requiring a tanker. Because of the increased lethality and range of standoff weapons, we may not need a platform as sophisticated as a B-21 to generate impactful projection. With the JASSM, you can stand off so far that the missile takes on the risk of penetrating the integrated air defense system, and thus you don't actually need an extremely stealthy platform to effectively strike critical infrastructure. This is one reason why the slow and unstealthy B-52 is still such a relevant platform. These drones could simply act as missile carriers, forming but one link in a wider kill chain which was all directed remotely by ADF centralized command. As they are merely one part of an integrated weapon system, they don't need to be extremely sophisticated or capable platforms. Simply carrying the JASSMXR to its launch position is all we would require of this aircraft. Essentially, they are just giving the missiles more range. Even if this Super Ghost Bat was twice as expensive as its little brother, Australia could still procure dozens of them. Finally, because these drones are not overly expensive or manned, they could be considered somewhat disposable, and because they could be procured in reasonably large numbers, they could seriously increase the mass of offensive fire the ADF could generate. As all of the intellectual property and research and development exists in Australia, any missile carrier would be designed to specifically meet the ADF's requirements. But what else could a missile carrying ghost bat derivative do? Well, what if we replaced the JASSMs with LRASMs or Joint Strike Missiles? Exactly the same logic as land attack applies to maritime strike. Both the JSM and LRASM have a probable standoff range in excess of 300 nautical miles. Again, 
with nothing more than a moderate level of RCS reduction and high subsonic crews, our missile-carrying ghost bats would be able to effectively employ these weapons by simply standing off. A hostile naval formation would be detected, tracked and classified by the ADF's ocean surveillance system, composed of space-based sensors, Triton unmanned aerial vehicles and the Jindalee operational radar network. The missile-carrying ghost bats would be directed to the target area by HQJOC, launch their missiles and return to base. The missiles themselves would then be given target coordinate updates generated by the ocean surveillance system and relayed through the ADF's global satellite communications network. Again, because the system as a whole, operating as a battle network, generates and maintains the firing solution, all you need strike aircraft for is to fly the missiles to launch positions, all of which could be directed remotely. The Super Ghost Bat should be stealthy enough to avoid detection at 300 nautical miles, especially if it carries the JSMs internally. Such a strike package could either operate alongside manned strike aircraft, augmenting the volume of fire generated by an F-35 element, or independently. The reality is, considering how much of the kill chain is fulfilled by the wider battle network and ocean surveillance system, you don't really need highly capable manned fighters to simply act as LRASM launch platforms. A simple, cheap, autonomous drone like a Super Ghost Bat can do that perfectly well. Now we have this missile carrying Super Ghost Bat, what else could we use it for? What about close air support? There's no reason why this aircraft couldn't drop bombs in a more permissive environment. Let's imagine a future Middle East scenario, where the Australian Army has deployed the Ready Brigade Group to a campaign against Iranian-backed insurgents in Iraq, and we want to provide it with fast jet close air support. Our missile-carrying Super Ghost Bats would be ideal in this role. With their long range and ability to be refueled by boom, they could loiter at 15,000 feet for hours, providing the force with persistent support. Its 4,000 pounds of payload would allow this aircraft to deploy four 500 pound bombs, a mix of laser guided GBU 12 paveways and GPS guided GBU 38 JDAMs. Again, with the battle network doing the heavy lifting, we don't even need our drone to be equipped with a sensor package or targeting pod. A joint terminal attack controller or other ground element can simply laze the target, generating a set of GPS coordinates. This information can then be data linked to the drone, which drops the bomb. The GBU-38 then guides itself to the target, or the GBU-12 is guided by a ground element that lasers the target as it moves. Alternatively, the drone could be equipped with a dedicated targeting pod, which can be manually controlled remotely. Again, once the MQ-28's core AI and computerized systems are developed, it could easily serve as the foundation for a family of increasingly capable, unmanned combat air systems, all designed, developed and manufactured in Australia to meet Australian requirements. Long-range bombers, naval fighters, missile carriers, even supersonic air superiority variants are all realistic possibilities once the core manufacturing and technological hurdles have been overcome. For a power like Australia, investing in these unmanned systems is a major area the nation can use to offset its numerical inferiority when compared to potentially hostile great powers in our region. This approach is also being taken in the undersea domain. The Ghost Shark, the underwater equivalent of the Ghost Bat, is currently under development by Angel Industries and the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. The underwater drone will eventually be the size of a school bus, have a maximum operating depth of 6,000 metres, and be capable of surveillance, anti-surface and anti-submarine warfare. Much like the Ghost Bat, the Ghost Shark will leverage AI to achieve very high degrees of autonomy. Again, just like its airborne cousin, the Ghost Shark will enhance the RAN's manned submarine force rather than replace it. These platforms will increasingly be made by Australians for Australia to Australian requirements. Undeniably, unmanned systems are becoming a key component in not only Australia's defence, but the Australian way of war, and the manned unmanned team will be absolutely foundational to the ADF's doctrine and wider capability throughout the 21st century.